Uh, Martinez and Daniel will be discussing uh, optimi optimizing the uh, service abstraction in Kubernetes, making it scale better using BPF. So please give them a warm welcome. Hi there, uh, my name is Martinez. So today's talk is going to be about making the Kubernetes abstraction to scale with the BPF. So first part will be given by me and the second part by my colleague Daniel. So the problem we are trying to solve is that Kubernetes, which is a containers orchestrator or just a distributed container scheduler, relies a lot on IP tables to um, implement the service abstraction. So for each service and its endpoint, it creates multiple rules. So in the case of 5,000 services, we have 25,000 of IP table rules, which makes uh, service traffic to experience low and uh, unpredictable latencies because each packet has to traverse the rules until a uh, <coughs> rule matching that packet can be found. And also another problem is that with IP tables, you cannot change the single rule. You need to install all rules at once. And this becomes slow, especially in the dynamic environments where you create and kill pods. Like every hour, you can create thousands of pods. And the last thing is like availability issues. So IP tables is using NetFilters contract. And this is, uh, it is prone to some race conditions. So. It becomes obvious in the case of UDP where uh, one packet can be lost and it results in application level timeouts. So before we dive into the implementation details, let's look into Kubernetes networking basics. So Kubernetes is a scheduler for containers and the smallest schedulable unit is a pod and the pod itself can consist of multiple containers and each container in the pod is running in the same network namespace and they share the same network device. And Kubernetes consists of multiple components, some are optional, some are not. And for, for this talk, uh, we put just a couple of components, the relevant ones. So for, first one is a kubelet. This is the main component for starting a pod. Then there's a CNI plugin, which is uh, not shipped with uh, Kubernetes, but it's up to your user which one to use. And in this talk, we'll be using Cilium. And the main task of the CNI plugin is to co configure the network for the pods. And next one is the Kube API server, so it's basically the entry point for your cluster configuration. So if once you want to deploy a new pod, install a new service, etc., you talk to a, a Kube API server. So for instance, once a user wants to deploy a Redis container in the cluster, uh, after a scheduling decision has been made on which node to run that container, Kube API server notifies the kubelets in the cluster about the change in the pod spec, and then the kubelet on the node B uh, asks the container runtime to start a container without the networking being configured, and then it talks to the CNI plugin to configure the network for it. And it's up to network plugin how to configure the network, but there's a hard requirement for Kubernetes that each pod has to be IP addressable and should be reached from any other pod in a cluster and also from a host inside the cluster. So uh, we cannot use the pod IPs to reach uh, pods reliably in the sense that uh, Kubernetes doesn't guarantee that the same pod IP will be used after a pod has been terminated or deleted and recreated. So for this, uh, Kubernetes provides the service abstraction so we can group uh, pods into uh, logical units and Kubernetes will allocate a virtual IP for that unit and each pod can be reached by using this virtual IP. So on the right side, we see the service definition. We basically select the Nginx pods and we create an Nginx service. And Kubernetes allocates for us the virtual IP 3.3.3.3. And as we can see, that service has two endpoints with the given IP addresses. 
So there are multiple service types, but for the stock it's enough to know that uh, there's a cluster IP and a node port. And for the sake of completion, we listed all the service types. And the component which implements the service abstraction in Kubernetes, it's called kubeproxy. So basically this component is responsible for installing the IP tables rules. And uh, this component is optional at, uh, and it can be disabled. So let's look at the cluster IP service. So this is the default service and basically it allows uh, either a host, a host in the Kubernetes close, uh, cluster or the pod to reach a service via virtual IP. And the, the way the uh, kube proxy implements it is with the following IP tables rules. So because the Po, uh, service has to be reached either from the pod network namespace or the for, for, from the host network namespace. It installs a packet steering rule uh, at the net table, at the uh, pre-routing at the output chain. And in the cube service chain, we do the it does the actual uh, service matching. So the matching is based on the protocol, destination IP and the destination port. And once a service is found, it jumps into the service chain. And in that chain, based on the probability, it selects the actual endpoint to which to route the request. So it's basically a poor man's load balancer with IP tables. And the endpoint chain is responsible for doing a DNAT translation to the, oops, sorry, for the DNAT translation to the actual pod IP. And the other service type is called node port. So this type is uh, similar to a cluster IP, but in addition, it makes services accessible from outside. So Cube API server allocates uh, some uh, port number from predefined range, and also Cube proxy installs the following rules. So it basically installs a rule to jump into the Cube node ports chain, and in that chain we do the again a matching, but this time on just on protocol and on the destination. Uh, port and once a matching uh, matching rule is found, it jumps to the same service chain. So as you can see from these rules, uh, that the more services you have, the more rules you have, and the more rules your packet has to traverse. So this is example just for one service, but if you have five five thousand uh, services, then you have uh, the cube service chain. 10,000 rules, so if your service ends up being at the very bottom uh, of that chain, so your, your, your request will experience high latencies. So with this in mind, let's look how we replaced the kube proxy, re-implemented kube proxy with BPF in Cilium. Over, so the work has been done over the couple of last three months, I would say. So Cilium itself is a CNI plugin, and it consists of two components. So Cilium Agent, it's a daemon which runs on each Kubernetes node. And besides that, uh, Cilium ships with a CNI executable binary, which is being called by a kubelet when it has to uh, provision a new pod. And the kubelet actually executes that binary, and the binary talks to, first it configures the uh, network interface, creates network interfaces, like network devices for the pod, moves to the network namespace, and in this case, we are running in the vir virtual Ethernet mode, but we also support the IP VLAN. And once the devices were uh, created and moved to the network namespace, next it talks to the Selim agent over API to allocate the IP address, and also to register this pod in, in, inside the Selim agent, which populate some metadata in the BPF maps and also loads on the TC ingress uh, BPF program. And besides that, Cilium agent is talking to the Cube API server and it reads, uh, gets all the notifications from there. Uh, so for instance, once it receives an event for service update, it reflects that update in the BPF map. And to make a pods reachable from a host, we have the Cilium host network device. And for the inter-host connectivity between pods, we either can install IP route or we can do the tunneling with the help of VXLAN or Geneve. And we create just a single device and then we 
configure like metadata to establish the tunnel mesh between devices. So before the 1.6 version, so 1.6 is the, the latest stable, we had the partial implementation of cluster IP and BPF. So in the case of, uh, let's say, client running on node A and uh, server running on node B, uh, we had the following programs. So one program was at is attached to the TC ingress of LXC0. And this program is doing the following. So it looks up at the BPF maps, whether a destination address is the cluster IP address. And if, it, if it's a destination address of a service, then it does a service selection based on P random. And once we have selected a service, it creates a contract entry for that service, for that flow in the BPF contract map. And also it does DNAT uh, translation. And Finally, it creates the egress entry so that the reply could be re reverse net translated. And another program is attached on the native device, again on the TC ingress, and that one is for handling the replies so that the uh, reverse translation could be happen. So for services, we have uh, a map, so it's a simplified version of it. So we have a placeholder or like front-end entry, which basically has this number set to zero. And it, by, by, by looking up this entry, we can know how many endpoints we have for this service. And after reading the count, we can do the service endpoint selection with the actual number being set. And for the contract, we have another map, LRU-based LRU one, and we have three types. So one is for service flow so that we can, for a subsequent request, we could select the same endpoint. And one uh, type is egress, which is used for reverse uh, net translation, and then ingress, mostly for accounting. Uh, so I mentioned that this implementation was partial, so we didn't cover the case where a uh, host application running in the host network namespace is talking to a, a cluster API service. So for that, before, in, before 1.6, we were relying on kubeproxy IP tables rules. And also for the node port, we also relied on kubeproxy IP tables. But in the latest release, we have implemented all the missing points with PPF. So yes, so the cluster IP from host network namespace. So we had uh, a few considerations how to implement that. So one would have been to attach a program to a TC ingress of Cilium host device uh, but, and do the service lookup from there. But instead of uh, complicating the code base of, of that program, we decided to take an advantage of C group hooks. So for the uh, cluster IP, we attach a SOC address program to the connect and send message syscalls. So uh, this program gets executed just before the protocol handler, handler starts to handle uh, those syscalls. So in the case of uh, TCP or connected UDP, we do the, uh, we run the following pro program, which reads, again, does the BPF map lookup. It tries to find the service and once it's, <coughs> if we found the service, it basically the ch it changes the destination of the SOC address. So to the actual endpoint IP and the endpoint port. And one nice thing about this that we don't need contract anymore. And also we don't have to change, we don't have to mangle packets. So it means that also we don't have to recalculate the checksums for packets. And additionally, there's a benefit that the load balancing cost is paid only once for TCP and connected UDP. So just when we want to establish the connection. And again, it works in both cases, in from host network namespace and pod uh, network namespace. So maybe luckily or unluckily, uh, it didn't work uh, with some UDP applications because some UDP applications are checking the uh, source address of a packet via re received via receive message system call. So for that, we have introduced uh, 
a new attachment type uh, for the receive message for the UDP four and six. And also we had to introduce the UDP map, uh, reverse net for the UDP, for the reverse net translation. So in that map, one of the fields in the key is the socket cookie. So it's used to prevent from accidentally uh, reverse net translating unrelated flows, which has connected directly to a pod IP without using the uh, service IP. And again, so we populate this map when uh, in the prog program which is attached to connect and send message, and we do the reverse net translation from the receive message. So next one is the node port. So it was a bit more complicated. So let's start with the simplest uh, example. So in the case when the remote, when the endpoint is running on the same uh, node as the request came to, it's fairly simple because we can uh, attach to a TC ingress of EF0 device on the host. Uh, this similar program where we do the, again, the C, uh, service lookup, DNet, and then we check whether that destination pod is a local or not. And if it's a local, we basically just do the SKB redirect to this LXC0. And for the reply, uh, the LXC0, like the program running on LXC0 can, via tail call, can do the reverse net translation. And then it has to do the FIB lookup because we need to know the L2 addresses for the, we need to set the valid L2 addresses for the packet, for the reply packet, otherwise it's going to be dropped. And then again, we do the redirect to a client. So in the case of a pod running on the remote node, uh, the, it becomes a bit more complicated because once we get a request on the node, it has to be forwarded to another node. And we have to do the SNAT from BPF because otherwise uh, node two will send back a reply direct, directly to a client. And because we don't distribute, we do not distribute the connection tracking uh, tables uh, among nodes. We need to uh, do the. We need to send a reply back to the node one so that it could do the reverse DNA translation. So in the in this case, we have a program on the TC ingress again doing the lookup DNAT and checking whether endpoint is remote. And depending on the mode, direct routing mode and tunneling mode, it, it picks. Uh, which interface to use for the uh, SNAT. And then we do the BPF SNAT and again, B FIB lookup and uh, redirect to the actual node running that pod. And once it has received the request, it sends to the, the, the target pod. And for the reply, it's uh, much more simple because, yeah, because the re request was SNAT, so the node two uh, sends back the uh, reply to the node one and uh, the TC ingress program is doing first reverse SNAT translation, reverse DNAT translation and FIB lookup and it finally sends the packet back to the client. So, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> um, and one more note on that. Uh, so we're doing the SNAT, but in future work, we're looking into doing DSR as well because, I mean, it would require tunneling, for example, IP and IP, but it would allow basically for the node where the actual backend is located um, to directly send a reply to the original client that requested it. Um, and the other thing is, you mentioned um, TC ingress, so like all this um, punting back out the packet could also be done in XDP as well. So that would be like a nice application of it. Um, so the way we do the SNAT is basically right now we have a, um, an BPF map, an LOU map actually for the, for the mappings. So it looks for example like this, that we have a tuple, uh, the direction and basically the um, destination address and port that we are translating into and depending on which direction we are doing the lookup, it will um, either like, it, it will then um, do the restore or like the original um, uh, remapping for the request. Um, we also do the um, source port. Uh, we 
so if there are collisions in the map, we have to try to resolve it. So right now we are doing a hash based, and if that fails, for um, some times, then we do the p random one. Um, the hash, for example, could be m uh, potentially helpful in some corner cases when the entry would get evicted from the LEU, and then uh, later on it's still like free. Um, it would reuse, try to reuse it. And we also have to track uh, local flows. So we have the um, Solium BPF connection tracker um, that is on the main physical device and it also would NAT connections from applications in the host itself in case there would be collisions in that they're reusing the, the source port. Um, so all of this um, was for the node port case was like when external traffic hits the node um, and then we're handling the request but there's also the case when applications or pods on that node itself would make a request to a node port service and the way they can do that is basically that um, in the node port range, which is I think by default 30,000 to 30,200 something, um, they can basically collect, uh, co connect to the loopback address to that port and then basically this would get rerouted to the backend, whether it's local or in some other node. I mean, it would be transparent to the application. And for that we use the cluster IP, the BPF-based cluster IP that Martinez presented earlier and extended it a bit so that it can handle the case when you connect to a loopback address or to any other address that is um, local on, on that node. So it would um, just have to connect to that specific port. And the nice thing is because it's like based on C groups, it's uh, actually a network namespace independent. So that means that even like the pods, they can connect to uh, the loopback address uh, out of their namespace and it would transparently get translated without us having to set up and go into every single network namespace. Um, yeah, and with that, basically, we can get rid of all the per service rules that QProxy would insert. And there are just a small number of rules left, which is, which are installed by Kubernetes themselves. Um, I think some SKB mark based drop rules. So um, potentially in future, it might be possible to actually even run it without NetFilter. Um, yeah. So some initial benchmarking that we did, because most of the services or microservices are um, HTTP based, uh, request responses and short-lived. Um, we we tried to create um, a, like some number of services up to like the default um, range that is the maximum for it, and uh, we compared that to the EPPF one. And it's the requests are going over the wire. So yeah, as you can see, like the BPF-based approach with the service lookup that we have there is um, pretty much constant as opposed to the uh, latency increase that you would notice um, over the Kube proxy, over the native Kube proxy implementation. So some of the improvements that we did along the way and some of the potential future outlook ones that we are, we're doing in this, con in this context, um, one of them was the UDP receive message hook. So because it broke DNS, so here's an example uh, where NSLOOKUP or also DIG and other tools, they would basically check that um, the IP address that they're connecting to, whether the reply is actually the, the real one based on the SOC message, uh, the SOC addresses um, that they're getting from the receive message call. So we basically added the BPF um, hook to that to do the um, reverse mapping. And with that, it basically resolves just fine. Um, then the other thing was that the uh, uh, socket cookies were per network namespace, so that was like a counter that would be increasing whenever you would call the uh, BPF cookie helper, then it would basically um, bump the counter and, and store that uh, cookie onto the socket. And there were some corner cases where you could um, create collisions from different network namespaces, but so we changed it to be global instead to resolve this. Uh, yeah, the other thing that right now we are doing from the um, 
uh, Solium orchestration layer is basically when we get the Kubernetes event uh, for new services, we basically push the services uh, entry and the backends that are related to that down into the BPF data path. And in the case of the Nodeport service, when the backend is remote, we have to do the SNET. And um, in, yeah, in, 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 some, in some cases, in the direct routing one, we noticed that the FIP lookup was failing um, simply because the, it doesn't have a neighbor entry for the remote backend. We noticed that uh, by testing on AWS because they all have like a flat L2 network that they provide to you and uh, so there it was failing. And basically, in case of tunneling, we don't really care because uh, we just, I don't know, we, so, so we just zero the source and MAC address and like on the remote end where the Solium node is uh, handling the incoming packets on, on the VXLAN device. We have another BPF program that does then like the forwarding. So it's um, all like L3 based in that sense. Uh, but yeah, like the, Never look up also doesn't do like a, um, an R probe, so we had to work around that. And it's a bit ugly. Um, right now from the daemon, it's basically doing the um, ARP request and then pushing down um, um, a permanent neighbor entry into the neighbor table so that it will basically resolve just fine after that. One thing we're um, looking into uh, is to potentially tell the kernel, I mean, because the kernel can do this best anyway, uh, to introduce a new type where you would just pass the L3 address and the kernel would resolve it by itself and keep maintaining it. Um, I haven't seen that it's possible today, so uh, might be a good, a good extension to not having to deal with L2 on the daemon itself. And we have also like a similar issue for node port requests that are coming from external to the node um, because in the end we have to send back the reply to the client um, and in that case we are basically keeping track of the of the MAC addresses in a small BPF LAU map and because that's uh, basically in the main path where you could also hit like where you have also high income um, it's probably better to uh, leave it at the BPF LAU so you don't get the neighbor table overflow um, yeah, so that should be like as it is, as we have it today. Uh, the other thing that we are thinking about is it would be nice to have a callback on LAU entry eviction. Um, the reason why that is, so right now in Solium Agent we have a connection tracking table in BPF and yeah, we support down to like quite old kernel, like really old kernels, like 4.9. Um, and based on the kernel type, either we choose the LAU or a hash table. And in case of a normal hash table, the thing has to be garbage collected. So that's being done out of the Solium agent. And um, the reason why we didn't integrate the NAT mapping into the connection tracking itself um, is that in the Solium case, uh, there's a requirement that when you, whenever you up or downgrade, it shouldn't break existing connections that are currently ongoing. So like all the BPF programs have to stay intact. And if you would um, change, um, for example, like the, like do bigger changes in the connection tracking table and other things, you would have to remove it or like some way to transfer it temporarily, which just creates, it's just a bit of an annoyance and like hard to get um, right, I would say. And yeah, so that's why we have it separate, which was the easier path. Um, and basically the garbage collection also cleans up um, along with the connection tracking entry, the net entry. Um, one thing that we noticed was that um, when, when, whenever we walk the map from uh, user space, it's basically quite, um, it, it, it messes with the LAU heuristic. So basically we uh, fixed that and um, yeah, but it could be avoided entirely to have a garbage collector in the first place if we would maybe have like a callback whenever like a CT entry is evicted that we can at the same time clean up the net mapping as well. So something we are looking into. Um, the other thing that, that might also be interesting is uh, if we could somehow like um, partition the um, uh, LAU eviction into zones 
for example, so, so since we have like the single uh, connection vacuum table in Cilium, it gets basically hit by traffic that is more east-west and also like, so this would be a cluster, it's like the normal cluster IP uh, services or like direct connections from pod to host or pod to pod. And it, at the same time, get also um, hit by north-south, so node port services as the example that we talked here. And uh, one thing that we would like to avoid is that uh, there would be like um, too much churn on, on the node, on the node port services, for example, and they would, uh, and, and then like cluster IP or other traffic couldn't really, um, would be interrupted because of that. Um, so it would be nice to have like some sort of a, like a guarantee that, okay, I'm only evicting from the zone that um, I'm supposed to, but like the other uh, traffic can still be ongoing at the same time. And that we only have like the single map where we do the lookup into fast path. Um, yeah, so and that could probably be realized through a map update um, to pass in the zone itself. The question that is a little bit less clear is like, how we would specify like how this should be partitioned um, on map creation. Yeah. Um, yeah, the other thing uh, um, we'll be looking into is like atomic operations. So um, it would be great to have like a f uh, faster reuse of, um, of those NAT entries. So one thing was the garbage collection that I mentioned, and if you would get rid of it, which would be great, of course. Um, then there was the issue that uh, from the connection tracking, once we notice that the connection is tearing down, that we can basically set like a state internet table that this is stale and potentially like if you, if the um, if the one who selects the new mapping would would find that they could basically just reuse it and go on with it instead of like. Um, having to search uh, further, for example. So, so right now there would be a PPF spin lock, but um, I think this could be optimized because like this would be two helper calls just for updating a state. And the other thing is also that it would create, it, it would have to be, um, it would create more space in the, the map values themselves because you have to store the spin lock. And this would also create up and down grade issues because of, uh, yeah, the map would have a different structure itself. So we have the BPF XAD instruction, um, which is, I think, mostly only good for counting, because it doesn't actually return the value like um, like an atomic ink return, for example, would do. So, and there's the spin lock. But I think, like in future, we would be good to have um, uh, the guarantee that we have read read once, write once um, semantics, which I think is pretty much the case. Um, today, just that we would have to force, like, like specify that everyone needs to implement it, also like all the JITs to make sure that this is the case. And would be nice to have some compare exchange instruction instead that we could then use. And then we could also integrate it into the, we talked about it, I think with Paul and Will, you can, um, into the K-Litmus test suite so that you, people can try different um, access patterns with, uh, uh, those instructions, and, and then it will give you some an output whether it's guaranteed or not. Uh, um, yeah, then there's one hook which is not covered, for example, in case of connected TCP or UDP, where you would where it would not be like transparent to the application itself. Um, because, so basically the idea is like to always hand back the service IP so that the application, which you don't change, of course, thinks it's connecting to the service, but actually it's connected to the backend. And if it would do get peer name today, it would still like find out that it's not connected to what it thinks it's connected to. So um, yeah, uh, that would basically resolve um, the get peer name part as, as well here. Uh, in, in terms of the Non-kernel change, um, in Cilium case right now, we, we don't make use of the in increased instruction lim um, limit or complexity limit at this point. So uh, most of the things there are basically 
outsourced into a tail call because otherwise it would explode like the 4K instructions with all the NAT engine and all this integration. Um, and because we're using tail calls anyway, but not BPF to BPF calls because it's like both are not uh, combinable together. Um, so yeah, it would be good that the agent would probe like for a new kernel um, where this uh, 4K limit is not the case and then we can also do more complex uh, collision resolution and, we should, um, and making use of bounded loops um, for finding NAT mappings. Yeah, so you can try it out. Um, in Kubernetes, there's a tool which is called Kube Admin. It's used for spinning up a Kubernetes cluster. Um, and there's a new option that we recently introduced. So it's called uh, skip phases, where you can basically skip the Kube proxy setup. This will be part of, I think, 1.16 in Kubernetes release. And then once that is like bootstrapped, you can uh, add any other worker nodes through the Kube Admin join to it. And then uh, you can create a Solium deployment YAML, because everything is deployed to YAML in Kubernetes and with the option node port enabled. And then you can apply it, and then it will basically spin up uh, the Kubernetes cluster with the BPF-based um, yeah, Kube proxy replacement. Yeah, it's pretty much it. Um, there, are, just to uh, give a note, there are two more talks on on Cilium. One is on transparent encryption, which will be today later on, and the other one on policy uh, tomorrow morning. So yeah, with that, do you have any questions? So your your uh, neighbor problem. Yeah. Yeah, I've thought about that one, and specifically ah, nice. for the XDP case. Yeah. If you look at uh, MLXSW for offloading routes, they mm -hmm. have to resolve the gateway before they can offload the next hop, before the prefix can get offloaded. So MLXSW has code already to track entries of interest and to keep that neighbor entry in um, a valid state, established state. Mm -hmm. um, I have thought about bringing that into either the core code and like making it an option so that when routes are pushed down, the kernel automatically kicks off the neighbor discovery and keeps those entries refreshed. You could easily do that in a kernel module as well. I guess the question here, though, is yeah. you have not gateway entries, but random host entries that yes. you're yeah, of interest. Exactly. So yeah. um, that's where you know maybe an external kernel module could could use the, the notifier hooks and easily kick off that state machine. Are you saying that like by default when we created IPv6 route, it would do the neighbor thing? You would add a flag, opt in, like a netlink thing. Um, so when you do a route add, you would have a flag on that gateway that says, I want the neighbor to kick off neighbor discovery okay. and to manage that that entry. And he would use that bit. He, you could, well, there'd have to be an extension to make it available for any host as opposed to a gateway. Uh, I see. Right? Okay. So gateways are super important because you can't offload the routes until the gateway has been resolved. You have to get the next hop information. Yeah, you got to turn that gateway into a neighbor entry. I see. Okay. Yeah, I, I think such a feature would be reusable for the OBS offload for the tunnels. We I can't remember what workaround we have, but probably it could be disposed of. So I think we we had a similar problem in, in something we were doing where we had that situation where the ARP table didn't have an entry for our destination on, on egress. So there's one hack you can do, and it's kind of ugly, but you can pass the packet back upstream, and if forwarding is enabled, what, what we do is we just make the source and destination MAC address the same, like your local MAC address, pass it back upstream, and then the OS will actually do the ARP lookup for you. So it's kind of a hack, but it's, it saves you having to maintain yeah. state in, in the BPF program, so. I can see how that works. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. On the other hand, if we want to port this to XTP, for example, I mean, I don't, I don't really want to make the detour, right? Yeah. Which would be. Uh, Please stand up when you ask your question. <coughs> Um, you talked about the use cases being TCP and connected UDP. What about disconnected UDP? Let's say so, a DNS server. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so what I mentioned basically, the um, connected UDP and connected TCP is handled through the connect hook, but the unconnected stuff is handled through send message and receive message. So there you have to do a translation. For the connected stuff, you don't have to do it. You just select it once, and that's pretty much it. 
Is that going to be able to scale side. with a large number of clients? Say again? Is that going to be able to scale with a large number of clients? Yeah, I mean. Okay. So, I, I, mean, I mean, those entries, they're only really needed for the case where the connection is actually still active. Otherwise, like, they would get LAU evicted and it's just fine. Couple of questions. I think I heard uh, Martinez mention that there you have uh, IP VLAN support. Do you have a diagram or something like that? Or ah, um, yeah, not on this slide, but um, basically, like when IP VLAN mode is enabled in Solium Agent, um, we create an IP VLAN slave in so we support L3 and L3S, mm -hmm. and then we move that um, slave into the network namespace where the pod is created, and um, the ugly part there is that we would have to attach the BPF programs that you saw earlier, like the BPF um, LXC on the right. on the Weave device that is host facing um, in the Weave case. We would have to attach them inside the network namespace. Um, so basically here. Right. So you cannot really um, allow workloads that are like un untrusted in that sense, right? So. Yeah, but we're looking into over overcoming that limitation in the future, but. Got it. And then uh, how do you upgrade? What do you mean? Like uh, for existing Kubernetes installation, right? If you mm -hmm. use if you use Cilium, how do you upgrade to the next? Oh, okay, yeah. so like, uh, I mean, if, if there's, an, if there's a, a new version of Cilium, for example, then um, the BBF da data path is basically Op still operational while the um, application itself is like um, um, restarted in that sense. And then basically when we um, re or, uh, recreate the BPF programs and we push them into the kernel, then we check the maps from the uh, BPF file system. We, we retrieve them and then we continue using them. So that's uh, how it basically um, retains the state and without disruption, right? I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has a question. I have one more question about uh, XDP uh, XAD. How hard would it be to add a XDP XAD return, like atomic add return, because we hit this issue at Google. Uh, yeah. So that's a really missing feature for us. Yeah, right. I think it should not be that hard. Um, I'm not sure if there are some bits we could still reuse inside BPF XAD. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's, there's a blocker in any way. I mean, w was it uh, some architecture which uh, prevented that, or some? No, it could be doable. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.